Well, it started in 1972, in the sense that was the very first meeting of the festival board. And that came, and I got involved in it because at that point I was on was in the Salisbury City Council. And um, I won't bore you how you got to there, but I persuaded the City Council to put up £3,000 to match the Arts Council, a guarantee against loss of £3,000. Um, the council didn't want to do it, but I, I persuaded them to do it. And um, because they'd invested this huge amount of money in, the, in this new organisation, uh, they said, well, we must put one of our councillors onto the board to, rep to safeguard this huge amount of money. Shove young Roger Townsend on it. <laughs> so this is how um, I, I found myself at the very first ever meeting of the Salisbury Festival, in, which then in the Red Lion Hotel, sometime in the autumn of 1972. And I knew nothing about the arts whatsoever. I knew nothing about how the arts were funded. And the first thing I discovered was that the, this amazing grant that the Arts Council uh, had given us of £3,000 wasn't a grant at all. It was a guarantee against loss, which meant that um, you had to spend the £3,000. But if you spent £3,000 and you made a deficit, that was your problem. But if you made a profit, then they'd claw some of the £3,000 back. So you would never, ever end up making any surplus. And you can only make a deficit. And that you could never also get any office furniture or equipment. So I provided all the office furniture equipment for the first festival office, which was held in my then business in in, um, in Brown Street. And um, so away we went. And we had the, the guy who set the uh, festival up was a guy called um, Anthony Hobson, who was the book director of Sotheby's at the time, and also chairman of the Salisbury Civic Trust. And um, he had over dinner had. He knew um, a novelist called Elizabeth Jane Howard, uh, quite a well-known novelist, um, who lived up in uh, North London at Barnet. And she had a friend called uh, Garant Jones, who ran his own chamber orchestra called the Kirkman Chamber Orchestra, and was also running um, a festival up in the Lake District. And so Anthony had got Jane Howard and Garant together, and they'd been to the Arts Council and persuaded them to put up the money. And so they were brought in immediately as directors, joint directors, the first year. And it was a very steep learning curve for me. And away we went, and um, Anthony got all his friends to um, be on the committee and what have you. And, um, and then three or four months ago, the, the, the festival was scheduled to be in June 1973, which was, got us off to a bad start because it clashed completely with the Southern Cathedrals Festival being held at the same time in Salisbury. Mm -hmm. And Anthony Hobson, in his great enthusiasm, never asked, never thought to ask the local organisations, you know, what else was going on. He just got steamrolled this whole thing. So that, that was a big issue at the time, particularly for me. Anyway, I, one day I was in my garden in, in March. I got a three-way call from Jane and Garant saying, look, we're absolutely fed up with Anthony Hobson being the chairman. And we, I said, well, you know, he was going out and saying to his friends over dinner, come and give a lecture, um, like Osbert Lancaster and Peregrine Worth, all these sort of people, come and give a lecture in Salisbury, and there's £250 in it for you. And there were the two festival directors with a budget of £6,000 in total, so, you know, with a game plan. Yeah suddenly having these people foist on them. And they said, well, we can't cope with this anymore. And I said, well, what do you want me to do about it? And they said, well, we want you to get rid of Anthony Hobson and we want you to be the chairman. I said, oh, my God, you know, and I mean, here I was from a stripling, knowing nothing about the arts whatsoever. So I thought, well, we can't do without the directors, you know, three months before. We perhaps could do without the chairman. So I had to write to Anthony Hobson and say, look, this has been the palace revolution. And he fell on his sword, to his great credit, and that's how I became the chairman the first year. And it's rather interesting, as you, you were saying earlier on, that this 1970, sorry, 2017 marks the end of the, an era of the current festivals. And it's rather interesting, actually, that one of the first lectures that was ever given in 1973 was, was by Sir Peter Scott, who founded Slimbridge, amongst other things. Um, and he gave a lecture on the sound of the whale in the city hall, which I personally never heard whales sound before, whales singing, what have you. But he filled the city hall. There were, there were about eight or 900 people in the city hall on a, an afternoon, it was only a Wednesday afternoon, to hear Sir Peter Scott. And he had these soundtracks, absolutely amazing. Um, 
And, and Peter Scott was the first husband of Elizabeth Jane Howard. You read it, and, um, which was interesting, although they were then divorced. Um, uh, and the 2017, the very last concert is, go, is a commission on the sound of the whale, yeah. bizarrely. Oh. Uh, so things come full circle, yeah. uh, which is going to be held in the cathedral. I'm actually singing in it, yeah. oh. uh, in the chorus of that. Um, so in a way, that's in a way, winds the whole thing up. And, and one of the things that I wanted to put into the archive was, was you know, what has happened in the festival in 45 years, in effect. Um, and I rather hope it would see me out, but maybe it will, maybe it won't. But this, and I've been on, I was on the um, uh, board for 30 years uh, and was chairman three times of it. So I've seen a lot of things in that time, good, good, good times and bad times, you know, high times and low times. And there's been some fantastic, fantastic events if, that have happened here. If you had to pick which would be your favourite, what would be the highlight? Yeah. Maybe if there's yeah, that, 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 that's a, that's a, it's an interesting question. It's an obvious question. It's a very difficult one to answer. It's a bit of forty-five years of events. I mean, I could pick out, pick out the highlights. Really, I suppose the first amazing thing was a candlelit concert we had in the cathedral with Iona Brown and the Academy of Saint Martin in the Fields, and I think they were playing Vivaldi. I think it was the Four Seasons mm -hmm. and the Lark Ascending too. I think I think, I think Iona was a violinist. <laughs> And they're playing the Lark Ascending. She was solo in Lark Ascending, Williams. And the, it was all by candlelight. It was the very first candlelit concert we'd had. And the place was packed, absolutely packed. People were sitting on the tombs, all around to get in. And um, we had, oh, I don't know, thousands of candles. I had to go and get uh, some candelabra, which came from the Dracula. Talk about Dracula, the Dracula film. Um, <laughs> I, I, we've got these huge dripping candelabra, uh, which uh, I picked up from somewhere near um, Heathrow Airport. Bought them down, put them in the cathedral. And of course, we were totally naive. We didn't think to put uh, sheets underneath them because we were dripping candles going down onto the stone, <laughs> onto the old stones. And, too. and of course, we had a devil's own job getting this candle wax off. And the cathedral learned a lesson. First of all, we were never allowed to put candles in them without having sheets underneath them. Um, and secondly, of course, they limited the size of the people, the numbers of people, for, you know, because of the, there wasn't health and safety then, but for fire and what have you. So we had to cut the audiences down, but that was sticks in my mind. Another thing sticks in my mind, um, not because it was a great concert necessarily, but it was an interesting one. Some people may remember there was a satirical guitarist called Jake Thackeray, um, yeah. who was an ex-school teacher, and he performed a lot on the, uh, television news, doing satirical songs, um, quite witty. And he was very popular, and, and we booked him to do a cabaret. Well, in fact, two or three, he came two or three times. And the second time he came, not the third, um, to play in the City Hall. And his agent rang up the day before. He said, oh, Jake Thackeray can't come. Um, we have to cancel. And of course, this is a nightmare to anybody organizing a festival. They've sold all the tickets. You know, what do you do? But he said, don't worry, we've got a girl uh, we can send down in his place. You won't have heard of her, but we think she's going to be the next big thing. So we thought, well, fair enough. We're trying to convince the audience to stay on for this. Anyway, um, this girl duly turned up. The other sound checks. And suddenly, to our total amazement, Jake Thackeray turns up. And we thought, well, you know, and he was crazy. He went mad. He said, well, I, we thought you were ill. You know, we've got somebody ill. He said, well, I'm not ill. Who told you I was ill? I know here I am to do the gig. And so um, a compromise was reached. He was absolutely mad. He was mad as a bird dog. And a compromise was reached whereby this girl would do the first half and Jake Thackeray would do the second half. And the name of that girl was Victoria Wood. Oh, oh no. Yeah. <laughs> And of course, Victoria Wood brought the house down, oh, and the audience yes. didn't want to let her go. No, and, but um, uh, you know that that's it's a lovely story in a way, and that's was was, was early Victoria Wood. Um, you know, I remember other little anecdotes. Really, we had John Elliot Garder and the Age of the Enlightenment in the um, in the cathedral. And we had to we have to bring in all the staging; everything has to be brought in, and the staging. 
had a kind of vibration. And John Elliott Gardner said, no, no, I'm, I can't go on with it. I can't, I'm not going to do this second half with all this vibration. I'm not going on the second half. And what we used to have, well, we still do have trogs. So guys who are volunteers coming in to help put up the staging. And we, we, I don't know why we called them trogs, but we did. <laughs> and so some poor trog had to lie on his back underneath the staging of the second half, holding the staging up. So John Elliott Gardner couldn't complain, couldn't you imagine. The hop for 40, 40 minutes, lying on his back, oh, holding the staging God. up underneath. Wow. Um, but I mean, they're all... <laughs> such is such the price of putting on a festival. But of course, the audience never know this. <laughs> Everything goes on quite happily. But I mean, all sorts of things. I mean, the, the, I mean H Helen Marriage, of course, when Helen Marriage was here, there were some spectacular things going on here. I remember trying to organise a rock concert. Um, which, of course, it never took place, but I, I, I was, was extremely keen to get young people involved in the festival because an arts festival, by definition, people think it's a fuddy-duddy, you know, a very staged thing, people in suits coming to it and, and or classical music. But in fact, we it, it, it was always important to me to involve the widest community and, of course, the young people uh, you know, it, it, it's so important to me to get young people involved, and what better to do it than through a rock concert, their own kind of culture. And um, uh, so we decided we'd put on a rock concert. The first problem we had, finding a site, because everybody said, you're not in my backyard, I don't want a rock concert around me. And we had a huge battle to find a site. We wanted to do it at the race plane. No, 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 didn't want to do that. People, the residents up there, a few of them complained like, bitterly. So in the end, we, we latched upon the um, old Sarum down in Hudson's Field. And the police were interesting, uh, trying to fight it every inch of the way. They could see another battle of the bean field from Stonehenge, you know, full of hippies and one another. And, and they wanted to know who the bands would be. They didn't want a new model army. <laughs> uh, you, Jim, you will know. Uh, they didn't want um, various bands they thought would be uh, radical, too radical, and bring the wrong kind of people. Um, the police chief at the time, we sat in a meeting, planning meeting, saying, oh yes, this is a wonderful thing to do, wonderful thing to do. We knew he was going back to the police station afterwards and saying, this is not going to happen over my dead body. Because we had a mould in the police station, he was coming back to us straight away, mm -hmm. telling us what was happening. And this guy was sitting there, and he kept saying to, "If this goes wrong, who am who am I going to prosecute for corporate manslaughter if somebody oh dies?" Sitting in that room, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Who am I going to prosecute? He kept saying, "Who am I going to prosecute out of you lot in the festival?" And uh, eventually, where is your car, Roger? Uh, uh, um, anyway, we overcame, we overcame this guy, he put all sorts of, we had to have strip, set, uh, boys and girls trips for drugs, tents, had to lay whole roads down from Castle Street into the thing, and I mean, he put every obstacle in our way, police helicopter we had to pay for, um, you'd be amazed, the obstacles he put in our way, but eventually we said, well, we'll do all this, we'll overcome all this, we booked a whole number of bands, of which Dodgy was the lead band, I remember. And um, uh, we went ahead and we wanted to sell 15,000 tickets. We had to sell 12,500 to break even. Two weeks before the event, we'd sold 500. And we were faced with a terrible decision. What do we do? Um, do we go ahead and lose 250,000, 200,000 pounds, or do we pull it now and lose 100,000? We poured it, we lost a hundred thousand pounds. It's our experience, mm -hmm. but you know, you learn, learn along the way. But would I do it again? Yes, I would. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would. Uh, because uh, I still think the thing was right, mm -hmm. the thing was right, the purpose was right. But you know, it, and it, it was a very, again, a very steep learning curve. I didn't understand, we didn't understand the rock business, mm -hmm. how different it is to putting on Beethoven's Fifth, yeah, and, and you know. It, that rock beer is a dirty, rotten business to be in. Yes. Um, you know, well, it was. Well, yeah, it, 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 it is a, it's a very different yeah. business altogether. We learned it was a very steep learning curve. But, you know, um, it was, 
have I regretted this? Taken up a huge part of my life. Yeah. This whole exercise yeah. it's taken up. How do you feel years. now, Roger, knowing that uh, for now we've come to the end of an era of the festival? How does that make you feel? Well, it makes me sad. It does. It does make me sad. It makes me slightly nostalgic. I mean, I'm not an active part of it anymore, but uh, I'd, I'd rather hoped it would be my legacy. In, in some ways, um, it still might be. I don't know. But I, I am nervous about the future because we've had so many wonderful times, so many wonderful occasions, all driven by inspirational people at the top. I mean, I don't include myself in that, but the, the artistic directors that we've had have been inspirational, um, by and large, and have brought, have brought entertainment to Salisbury that would never would have been possible without them, and uh, have opened people's eyes to the art of the possible. And I just hope that that will continue, but I am concerned that it will continue in the same way under the new larger umbrella, which I know at this stage very, very little about. But um, without somebody actually driving, having the inspiration to drive the festival aspect of it, and putting on things like like we're doing now, the Sound of the Whale, the Howard Moody thing, we're doing these commissioned work, um, which is so important, rather than just booking people on the festival circuit. Mm. You know, a lot of writers, or a very easy, very cheap literary festival, very cheap to put on, relatively. Um, and I would hate to see it ending up like another, just as another literary festival, without the opportunity to bring 200, 300 people together to create something like we're creating now, for the sound of the whale. Well, we did, indeed, for the... Um, a commemoration of the Christmas truce was completely commissioned work from, from scratch, involving you know two hundred men who never didn't know each other all singing together, and it was again it was a lovely experience in the cloister, and I hope that will continue, but whether it will, who can say?